There we are. So I am absolutely delighted to welcome you to our ninth Green Ribbon campaign to our final session. And this week we are focusing on a week to see change. So last year we focused on the theme of discrimination and we were trying to understand what does discrimination look like? What does it mean? And how does it show up in society? And this year we decided that we were going to look at that in more detail and start looking at, well, what if we broke it down? What parts of that could we understand in a different way? And that's how we hit upon the theme of exclusion. So this idea of where does exclusion show up? How does it manifest? And what part do we take in it? So we've had great conversations this year about what exclusion looks like and where it shows up in society. So if you haven't heard all of our podcast sessions, the Sea Change sessions with the Little Gale are available on our website on Spotify and Anchor. And some of our speakers today and some of their colleagues have been on our podcast. So please do check into those conversations and hear those. And also the other events to do with exclusion will also be online for you to catch up on. But this is really about finding out how exclusion has a negative impact on a person's mental health. And for us, it's about what conversations we can have and how we can change that. So today we're going to be looking at the positive changes that we can all as individuals make to be more inclusive. So firstly, I'm going to introduce you to our panel today. So for those of you who don't know me, I am Barbara. I am the Sea Change Programme Coordinator um, and I'm the team lead for the Green Ribbon Campaign, for the Ambassador Programme, for our Workplace Programme and for our general projects as well. So I have Rachel on the call with me today. She's our comms and marketing officer. And as part of our discussion today, we have a wonderful lineup. Rachel, I'm gonna let you move on a slide there. If you wanna skip my slide and go straight to our first speaker on the slide and we can let them introduce themselves, please. The, the lovely time when we are all um, panicking over tech, isn't it? So Martin, we are delighted to partner with Mental Health First Aid Ireland and we have had many conversations with Mental Health First Aid and we are delighted that many of our ambassadors have also done the first aid training. Martin, you're so very welcome to join us. If you would like to tell us a little bit about you and about Mental Health First Aid so that everybody knows um, you know, what, what conversation we've been having. Absolutely. Uh, Barbara, look, thank you very much for having me uh, here today for this uh, this general discussion around that whole area of inclusion. Um, my name is Martin Gillick. I'm the manager with Mental Health First Aid Ireland. I've been with Mental Health First Aid Ireland since about 2019, originally in the role as the national training lead for, for our adults and workplace program. And um, have over, what do you got, prior to that, I spent 35 years in the Defence Forces with the last maybe 15 years or thereabouts working in the area of mental health and well-being more or less as a, what we refer to more or less as an employee support officer, or more or less an EAP professional. And um, but it would have dealt with uh, both the serving members, veterans, families, in the areas of, what do you got, you know, everything from uh, financial concerns right the way through to health, well-being, and of course, mental health, from that perspective. Um, but in my current role, more or less, I manage the team at Mental Health First Aid Ireland and Mental Health First Aid Ireland is very much about providing training to, what is, to all communities and all people there to give people the skills to enable them to engage with someone that they're concerned about that may be experiencing um, a men, what is, are developing a mental health problem or experiencing a mental health crisis. I suppose very much is about developing that, that sense of actually confidence that as a community, as a nation, as individuals, that we can what is, we can engage with someone and we can engage with someone very much in a supportive and empathetic way and what is, provide that person with the help and support that they may need. And, Such an uh, important again, thing. Absolutely, hugely important. And again, working in conjunction with Sea Change very much to reduce the whole stigma and the, the exclusion that happens as a result of somebody who may be experiencing a mental health problem. Absolutely. And for anybody who wants to find out more about Mental Health First Aid Ireland, um, we will have their information in the chat um, and we will also follow it up in, in the links when we post this video as well. So, Martin, you are so very welcome to join us and we're looking forward to the conversation with you today. So I now invite our next speaker, Ashling O'Neill, if you would like to tell us a little bit about you and your story and how you um, came to be where you are and um, I suppose how we can be a little bit more inclusive or what being inclusive in this conversation means to you. Hi Barbara. Hi. 
Um, my name is Ashing O'Neill. Um, I'm a mother of three. Um, I have one angel in the sky, um, my daughter Mia. Um, she passed away in September of 2019 following a battle with um, mental health. Um, and I have two little soldiers on the ground. I like to call them my little soldiers. Um, I have a almost 13 year old and an almost six year old. Um, I became, I suppose, an advocate um, for mental health, um, uh, an anti-racism activist, um, and uh, an advocate for suicide awareness following the death of my daughter in 2019. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar uh, with uh, Mia's story, um, she passed away, as I said, following mental health battle. Um, she took her own life in the 6th of September 2019, um, following years of racial abuse um, and bullying that began at age four. Um, and she subsequently developed um, a mental illness as a result of the trauma that she experienced. Um, uh, she began self-harming. Um, she made her first suicide attempt in June of 2019 while she was um, attending um, services uh, for a number of years, uh, psychiatric and psychological services. Um, uh, where she was really failed um, by those services um, and the lack of them. Um, and I was fighting for um, her life um, from that June until the September when she passed away. Um, I had been desperately fighting um, for her. Um, she was unable to do so for herself. She was really, really ill. Um, and I was seeking services for her. Um, she was being passed from one service to the other. Um, her needs weren't being met. Um, and it was all kind of left in my lap to try and save her life. And unfortunately, I couldn't and we lost her. And I became very passionate at that point um, about telling her story and, and advising people and, and letting others know um, what happened to her and uh, how we got to this stage and, and what we could possibly do in future to stop this from happening in other family. Thank you so much for sharing, Ashing, and I appreciate how difficult that must be, especially given the month that's in it, you know, her anniversary being so close. But to see your bravery and your courage to have these conversations and to help other people to have different conversations is such an empowering thing to do. And I would just like to firstly say I'm so sorry for the loss that you've experienced and thank you for the work that you are continuing to do for so many. I think it is really, really important. And for the uh, Roots in Africa Ireland Network, I think for anybody who hasn't been aware, you know, I think it is about connecting in and finding out. So I would encourage everybody to go and have a look there and to find out more about Mia's story and to get behind that. So thank you so much for joining us and we're looking forward to hearing more from you during this discussion. Thank you. Thank you. So Keith, I'm going to turn to you now if you would like to tell us a little bit about you um, and a little bit about how you um, joined us for this conversation. Yeah, so basically I was involved with um, another charity called Suicide or Survive over the last couple of years and one of the guys was involved with them as well as Sea Change and put me on to the fact that Sea Change were looking for ambassadors this year. So um, we applied and, uh, and I was successful in, in and uh, becoming a sea change ambassador basically so and um, we own my own kind of story would come from a uh, history of depression and, and anxiety from a very very young age um but as well kind of through work and life I've, I've worked in the army i've worked as a guard and i've worked in the fire services so i've always worked in roles where i'm looking to help other people maybe um so over the last 25 years um, when I joined the Guards, I stayed there for about seven years and I've been in the fire service for the last 18 years now. And I've often gone to situations where people have um, either died by suicide or attempted uh, suicide. And I've had to attend those scenes and deal with them, whether it's um, consoling the person themselves or consoling a family member after um, something has taken place or maybe just talking them through it or dealing with the person that has has actually died by suicide in relation to the, the medical side of things. 
Um, I was doing that while also dealing with my own um, mental health issues as well. Um, on top of that, then, because I had such a huge passion around it, in 2013, I became a critical incident stress management uh, peer supporter within the job. So I was tasked then with defusing and debriefing crews after they'd gone through traumatic in, uh, incidents as well. So all that kind of, uh, I was taking all these things on top of myself and I probably led to a burnout and just taking on too much. So in 2017, I made an attempt on my own life and um, I, since then I've been trying to understand how I got to that point in my life and as a, as a part of, as a part of, as a part of my journey then in relation to um, understanding that we feel that it's probably a good way of doing that is to help others and maybe tell my story in relation to it um, and and uh, while helping others probably try to discover a small bit about myself then as well amazing thank you and thank you again for sharing such a personal story and i think that's one of the things that we really all need to understand that we all have mental health and it's about what we can do to mind ourselves and become more aware so things like learning the different training but even you know what you said there about trying to understand more for ourselves what's going on and and trying to to deal with it in a slightly different way i think that's really really empowering um so thank you so much for sharing that and for anybody who wants to find out about uh, Keith's story and the different bits and pieces he has been on our podcast as well so um, if you would like to, to look into that again check out our social media which Rachel has put into the chat and will be on our website as well. So to jump into some of the questions, because really today what we want to talk about is understanding the knowledge that we have on this panel and the difficult life experiences that we've collectively been through. We have a really strong understanding of what, it, like, what it's like to feel excluded. But today we really want to focus on inclusion and what that might look like. So to start off, I'm going to turn to you, Ashling, and ask you, can you tell us what inclusion means to you? You're on mute. <laughs> My Sorry. Um, well, to me, inclusion is a universal human right um, that everybody should have. Um, it's about having equal access and opportunities um, without barriers, um, you know, and it's eliminating discrimination um, prejudice, um, ignorance and intolerance. That's amazing. And I think it's really interesting, even when we talk about discrimination, that for a lot of people, while they understand the concept, they don't know what that looks like in the real world or what it might feel like when we experience it. So um, thank you for sharing that. I think that's it's really interesting to hear it's such an empowering way of saying it, I suppose. So um, and Martin, I'm going to turn to you with the same question. So from a point of view of being more inclusive, what does inclusion look like to you? Interesting, that, you know, um, we were talking, you were very much asking, very much talking about very much that sense of feeling excluded, for, you know, human right to be included. I'm going to go a little bit simpler. I'm going to say, look, it's that sense of feeling loved, feeling connected, you know, feeling that you're, you're not, you're not alone. And so many of us can feel alone. We, you know, we can be there. There can be many people around us, but we can still feel very lonely within the crowd that's out there. So for me, it's that sense of connection, that sense of basically feeling that I'm actually, I'm a, I'm a worthwhile individual and the, the people do care, they do love me, you know, regardless of who I am and all the different, what do you got, uh, issues I may have that, I'm, you know, that I, I still feel supported. So that's what inclusion means to me. Yeah. I think that's amazing. And again, it kind of goes back to that thing that we're all human and we all need that connection, you know. And I think when we start thinking about mental health and sometimes we have this idea that, well, I don't have mental health or I don't have issues with mental health. When we start understanding that we all have mental health, but when we understand it in that way to say, well, actually, we all do better when we feel loved and we all do better when we feel like we have that bit of support. And the thing is that actually, you know, if we were to link what Ashling said and what you said, if I don't feel like I have an equal right or if I feel like I'm being discriminated, if I feel I have the love of somebody to support me, maybe I will find my way to finding those things, you know, and feeling support can help us in a different way. So it is about these layers and it is about finding our individual feelings and thoughts about these things as well, because everybody has a different experience 
experience and a different opinion on what it is. So it is, it's really interesting to, to have that kind of conversation. So Keith, I'm going to turn to you and ask you that same question. So what does inclusion look like to you? Yeah, I think I'd, um, I'd refer back to what Martin said there, a small bit in relation to a uh, feeling of connection. Um, and we'd also add as well, a feeling of psychological safety there where you're, you're allowed to be included within a group society or a particular cohort of people that you feel safe in and safe in the knowledge that you can be yourself and your own little quirks or uh, idiosyncrasies, you know, that they're accepted as such, like, you know, that we all, we all have the self-worth and we all have this um, belonging to be here on this earth, like, you know, and to have that safety to be able to express yourself in such a way as you feel, you know, positively right to do so. Um, and so in, in having that safety there, then you're able to um, uh, contribute then to that, that group or society uh, in your own special way, rather than if you don't feel safe and you don't feel included, those gifts and those things that you, you know, you have there and you brought to earth here, um, they'll never be seen by anybody else. So it's a real, it's a real sense of psychological safety um, within, within a group and within, within society, I think. That's an amazing point. And I think now if we can layer those three things, you know, if we had those rights, if we weren't being discriminated against, if we had love and support, and if we felt safe, and particularly when we're talking about psychological safety, because it, it, that's very different than, you know, sometimes feeling physically safe. So and, and also it can impact on our sense of physical safety as well. So if we were to layer all of those things and bring it together, imagine how empowered a person would feel and how supported they would feel. But it's that, those things that we're looking at to say when somebody is struggling with their mental health, maybe they don't have those things. And this is how we need to start looking at what we can do. But it's also about looking at ourselves and saying, well, do I feel I have those things in moments when I'm struggling, whether it's for my own mental health or if I am a supporter of somebody who is struggling with their mental health, because we all need those things all of the time. And so Keith, just thinking about that idea of the psychological safety, can I ask you then about what ways can people be um, being included benefit a person's mental health? Well, as humans, we're, so, we're social animals um, and we look for that connection. You know, we were born, you know, generally into a family unit where we have that safety there. And then, you know, once we grow and we mature, then, then we are, we can expand our comfort zone there, you know. So we are social animals, like, you know, and we are pack animals as such, like, as well, like, you know. So if you don't have that inclusion, it goes against your your genetic makeup or your, your own psychological makeup because we look to be surrounded by other people. So you can imagine then that if somebody who is um, naturally um, inclined to be around other people and looking to express themselves in a safe way around them is not given that opportunity, um, they're going to just kind of come in, come in on themselves much, much more. Like, you know, and the more you're excluded, then the harder it is to, um, to actually you know, step forward and, you know, and put yourself forward and to be part of society as such. And um, to be included then, you know, for our mental health, it's huge in relation to the energy output, in relation to how they feel about themselves, in relation to looking at life in a positive manner on a daily basis then as well, and be able to actually strive and strive for whatever they want in their own life, like, you know. And I think that's it, isn't it? That this idea of when we struggle with our mental health, that we can't strive and that we can't thrive. You know, that that idea that it's, you know, you're, you're stuck, you're going to be there all the time. Um, but, I, I, you know, I think you're, you're absolutely right. It is about reaching out and trying to, to be more inclusive on a more regular basis. And sometimes, you know, when we talk about being excluded, particularly you mentioned about going to events and doing different things. For somebody who's supporting somebody else who is struggling with their mental health, maybe that person has cancelled a couple of times or maybe they have just flat out said they're not going to go. You know, maybe they are struggling with anxiety or struggling with different things that we don't know about. And the thing that we would say is don't stop asking. You know, it is very difficult when we keep getting turned down and we keep thinking, oh, sure, you know, Barbara's not going to come anyway. She's already said no five times. The thing is, maybe the sixth time is the time that I might show up. And it's about how we show our solidarity and say, do you know what? I'm still here. If it doesn't suit you, you know, next time. Because sometimes, you know, and I think you were kind of alluding to it a little bit, Keith, there about the, the kind of um, 
the self exclusion, that piece, you know, sometimes that we that we actually exclude ourselves when we start feeling some of those things. So it's about what we can do in that. So some really, really great points there. And Martin, I'm going to ask you the same thing, because obviously with mental health first aid, you do a lot about that, that psychological safety piece and about having those different conversations. So to you, what what ways uh, can being included benefit a person's mental health? I think basically you just have to reiterate a lot of the points both yourself and Keith made that sense of actually look at the end of the day we're social creatures we are pack animals we because it's about that sense of actually feeling connected and when we feel connected firstly what do you got I suppose you can almost go back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs you know that sense of you know the safety feeling loved and it, it enables it enables people then to actually you know to make positive positive changes to strive, take on the challenges that we have, that we all have in life in many respects there. And I suppose from a mental health perspective, even if we look at, I suppose, what we do in Mental Health for State Ireland, from the point of view of teaching people skills about engaging with people, opening up, providing that psychological uh, uh, safety or that safe space where somebody can really tell you what's going on for them. You know, and again, encouraging people to access supports when when those people need them and Barbara you mentioned that that fact that you know you know does it does it is it success your first engagement with somebody you know opening up it's not necessarily no life doesn't go on like that life life is life so I think realistically you know being a little bit persistent without without being rude to the to the person themselves there and letting the person know that you're there for them and I think that sense of actually where somebody feels that people are there for them, people are there to support them, enhances that sense of inclusion, enhances that sense of actually, do you know what? I'm part of something bigger. But yet there are supports out there. And most of us, I think, can do that. But also from the point of view, just be aware that, you know, if you're volunteering, you're involved with a local club, whether that's with young people or it's, or, or it's basically with people of your same age or older, that you're more aware that actually, yes, I need to be more inclusive here. I, you know, I need to basically engage with everyone. And very much that everyone's opinion, we might, although you might not agree with it, does matter. And very much, so I suppose for me that I see inclusion as basically, it's, it's all, while well, it's about basically supporting somebody who may be struggling with their mental health, it's wider than that. It's very much, it's about basically but encouraging people to be, what again, be part of, of more or less a, a greater, a greater sense of society or a greater group out there. It is, and I and I love what you said there about you know maybe not necessarily needing to agree with somebody, you know, and I think that is one of the biggest things that we have really seen across all the conversations we've had this year about exclusion. This idea that everybody should be the same, we shouldn't. You know, and it's not that we're asking everybody to to accept and love every single thing about every single person, but to know that it's OK to be yourself in whatever way that is. And that means it's also OK for other people to be themselves in whatever way that is, from whatever community they're coming from, from whatever part of society we are in. And I think that's the bit that we need to talk about more and understand a little bit. And it's also OK to, to be to be asking. You know, so that piece when you're talking about supporting and being there to listen to people, it isn't about having to have all the answers. And it's one of the things I love about what Mental Health First Aid Ireland does. It's about holding the space until appropriate care arrives. So it's about maybe finding out what is that appropriate care and how could we possibly tap into that? So, you know, while I know we have a long way to go and there are a lot of services that are under massive pressure for the services that are there, there are some things that we can be doing to be supporting ourselves while we're supporting other people. And I think that's such an important thing to do. So it is about when we're talking about being inclusive for ourselves, you know, is it that I need to reach out to somebody because maybe I've been the one who's been saying, no, you know, I'm grand, I can't make it. Or, you know, there there is those different things, but I love what you said about being part of something bigger. And I think that's really it, isn't it? It's that, that piece of feeling included and belonging to something more than ourselves. But when we're talking about exclusion, and I suppose the difficult side of that, you know, we think about what it's like to feel excluded. Um, so, Ashley, I want to turn to you and, and ask if you're comfortable doing so, if you could share an example of a time that you have felt excluded and maybe what that person or people in that scenario could have done or did 
to make you feel included or if so if they didn't do it what they could have done better you know to make the situation better for you well i suppose in terms of of mia and her story um Mia was of mixed heritage and um, she was Nigerian Irish and um, she always felt a sense of not belonging. She didn't know where she belonged. Um, and that was something that I, we both struggled with because we lived in a predominantly white area. Um, and at the time that I had Mia, she was basically the only mixed race um, individual in, in the village. Um, so we would have had, when I was walking down the street with her um, in her buggy, um, I would have had comments um, from strangers um, asking me, was she my child? Um, you know, very personal questions that you don't just, you wouldn't just normally ask anybody. Um, they would make comments, um, you know, she's a very exotic looking baby. Where did you get her? Um, you know, and I constantly have to explain that, no, she is my child, you know. Um, I grew her, you know, and she, I, I birthed her myself. Um, and, and people were puzzled, you know, that I would, I would have this um, brown baby. And um, so I, I felt excluded in that way. Um, and, and Mia felt excluded um, from, you know, main society. Um, we, were, we were considered different. I was considered different. She was considered different. Um, I would have comments, um, you know, growing up with her, where people would say to me, you know, what's wrong with your own race? You know, would you not like men from your own race? Why did you go outside of your race and, and have babies outside of your race? You know, I would have people come up to me and tell me, um, you know, you're going to have problems with your child growing up. You know, people are going to be not nice to her. Um, we had incidences where people would come up and just touch her hair, invade her personal space, um, strangers, and, and say, oh, can I feel it? Before they had even asked permission, they would already have their hands in her hair. Um, uh, she, she found that very traumatic. You know, there were strangers invading her personal space when she was quite a young child. Um, and they were kind of things that we had to deal with continuously. Um, so she... And, and then she didn't really feel that because she went to a predominantly white school and she, you know, she, she was associating with predominantly white individuals, um, even though I tried over the years to kind of encourage her and, and kind of bring her to, you know, different events that were kind of for her culture, you know, to show her, you know, her Nigerian heritage and things like that. Um, she just felt like she didn't belong there either. So she kind of didn't know where in society that she fit and and that's what i suppose affected her mentally and um, she didn't have that sense of belonging she was always looking for where she was supposed to fit in and 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 trying to support her as a mother and, and support somebody with a mental health condition it's very hard um and to try and you know say to her you know you're you're so unique there is only one mia o'neill you know there's nobody else that can be you and, and, and this is what you bring to the world, Mia. And you don't have to belong to a certain set. You know, you are an individual, you know, and, and what you bring to the table and what you offer is so unique and, and so beautiful. And, and we have to try and embrace that and, and not be constantly trying to look for where you fit in because wh why do you have to fit in? Um, and I know as individuals, we, we tend to kind of want that naturally. We want to fit in. But I think we need to have conversations where we build resilience in people and um, empower individuality and um, embrace uniqueness. And, and that's really, really important. Um, and the, the REI network, um, I'm so happy to be working with them. Um, they were born out of um, Mia's story um, to be a support, a support network for people um, who, who feel like they don't belong or they're excluded. And, um, I didn't have that um, with Mia growing up. Uh, there was no support system for me. It was basically me and her um, trying to stand up against this racism and this hate and this bullying. Um, and I feel that I wasn't supported by my own peers. Um, yes, by family and friends, but you know, if, if somebody saw her being racially abused, um, a lot of the time people chose to ignore it and just walk by it. 
and maybe she would have felt more of a sense of um, belonging and solidarity had, you know, complete strangers stood up and, and stood for her and said, you know, you're racially abusing a child, that's wrong. You know, you, you shouldn't be doing this. And it's important that people use their voice and speak up and when they see hate, and, and not to ignore it. it. It's not something that you walk by. In the you're community. absolutely right. And, and, think, and, and call it out for what it is. And I think that's such an, an important thing that we need to start looking at that piece of how do we do that? Because I think a lot of people don't get involved because they're afraid. They're afraid of saying the wrong thing. They're afraid of getting involved. They're afraid of lots of different things. But I heard also at the beginning when you were, we were talking about some of the experiences, maybe some of the ways that we could ask people to do things differently is that idea of thinking before we speak, you know, not assuming that we can reach out and touch somebody else's hair or their clothes or that we, you know, that we can ask such personal questions. So maybe the, the ask would be that we would ask people to consider what they say and consider if they were asked those questions, would they be comfortable with it? You know, and maybe to be asking advice from the person to say, well, what would what would that be like for you if it would be different? You know, or what support could you need in this moment? So again, thinking about maybe some of your, your network that could have been there in a different way for you. If maybe they had asked you, what do you need right now? Or how can I be there for you? Maybe those are some of the ways that if we were to ask people to be more inclusive, does that does that sound about right? That if, if people were to take that kind of tone and that kind of tact, that it might have been a slightly different experience? Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. If, if we had felt supported and if it had been majority stating that this is, an, you know, it's vile behaviour, it's not, it's not, you know, we're not going to tolerate this um, and we're against it and we condemn it. Um, I suppose I would have felt more supported and in that she would have felt that I'm being listened to, you know, my feelings are being validated, people understand that what is happening to me is wrong, but yeah. she never felt that, she never got that support, and even from an authority and, and, and people that were, were there to protect her, that were supposed to be there to protect her, she never, she never felt that, so, you know, um, going forward, you know, having these support services in place for other other people that might be going through something similar, it, you know, that's what's really important. Of course it is. And I loved what you said there about validation as well, because it's one of the things that we certainly see when we're talking about mental health, this idea that, you know, you can never know what somebody is going through. So if we can make somebody feel heard in that moment, I think that is so very important. Um, and I'm just thinking about then that, that piece of self, self exclusion and that experience. And Keith, I'm going to turn to you on this question and just ask you about that piece around self exclusion, where people exclude themselves from certain things, um, either situations or environments. Could you ex um, ex share some examples with us about what people could do to be more self inclusive? So how they can work towards including themselves more? Um, I think it's it's around maybe the topic of a uh, self-awareness of what you're going through at that particular time so if if you're looking to be more inclusive and trying to include yourself um but you do still have say mental health difficulties or you're going through situations um as Ashley was saying there you know that sort of somebody might have something going on within their own life like you know which they feel is a barrier to including themselves it's having an awareness that even though you have these issues going on, um, that it should take ownership of your ability to include yourself. Um, and once you take ownership of your decisions, you know, take ownership of the fact that you are who you are, you have self-worth and you have that um, the same right as anybody else to be included in whatever is going on or whatever you want to be included in. Um, and but the, yeah, there's also a thing of, in my mind, to set boundaries around where you want to be included. You don't just include yourself in something or in, in, in a group just to get along or just to be part of something if it's not congruent with how you are or who you are as a person. Whereas a lot of us maybe just go with the flow um, just to be seen to be included. But that kind of tears us aside because it's not really what we want. Where we want to have that self-inclusion is to be included as a whole person, as who you are. Um, and to be able to present yourself as who you are rather than just who you think people want you to be or how you want to be seen in society. I think that's such an important uh, point, Keith, you know, 
that we're when we're talking about being more intuitive and getting out there and doing different things that it is doing it in such a way that isn't against who you are and that you're not trying to put a mask on and you're not forcing yourself to be any different. You know, I think that's really, it's really important for people to remember that. And I think with all the pressures of life, the way we have, you know, from work, from friends, from family, from different areas in society, there are lots of times that sometimes we do, we do go and do those things. We do get involved with these things and we don't consider actually, is that what's best for me? And particularly when we're thinking about somebody who's struggling with their mental health to add that layer, because then you're nearly in a space of kind of guilt and strange feelings of, well, you know, I'm here, but I shouldn't be here because I'm not really involved in this or I'm not really interested. So I think that's a really important point for people to consider what's important in your life and how can you be more involved in those things? Because that is so very beneficial. Thanks for thanks for sharing that. And Martin, I'm going to turn to you about um, examples of stigma free behaviour, because I know it's something that we've talked about before about behaviours and how can people make others feel more inclusive in the behaviour that they have? Absolutely. And, uh, you know, we, 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 I think we've had multiple conversations in relation to this. And I think we, we get, it's been mentioned there a couple of times, just the whole area of language sense of actually being aware of our own language, the language that we use, you know, whether it's, whether it's you know, referring to a child as an exotic child. I was actually shocked when I heard that, uh, actually, but, you know, very much that, that sense of actually, I think language is key here. How we use our language, how we, what do you guys, we use that language to basically ensure that we don't exclude, we don't leave people behind I'll, I'll give you an example, and it's it, it, it's not directly mental health related, but it's, it's from a personal perspective. Back in 2012, um, I received a, a more or less a, a specifically severe cancer diagnosis. But I remember at the time actually having the diagnosis or getting the diagnosis. And the best way to describe it is actually feeling like the third person in the room. So even that sense of actually that what you get while the discussion was going on, you know, you were actually excluded from that discussion, but you do, and it was a sense of actually also self exclusion as well by not self advocating on my own behalf in relation to that. But that, that was a, an, exa an, exa an example of where, you know, and again, the, I suppose the knock on effect that basically getting that diagnosis then had to my own mental health at the time in relation to it and basically experiencing depression as, as a result of what was actually going on. But absolutely, I think language is key. We have to be aware of, of, our, of our language and also be aware of basically how, how other people perceive us. Simple little things, my body language. If I'm engaging with someone, where I engage, where I open up conversations. And specific, specifically, if I'm worried about someone's mental health, what I would say to you, they're finding the time, finding that space to have that approach. And very much, sometimes what happens here is, and I know I'm... I can waffle till the, the, the cows come home. But that sense of actually what you got, listening as opposed to talking, actually really hearing what's going on for the person and reflecting back what, what you've actually heard, you know, can, can it be very supportive from that perspective there. And be aware of your own prejudices. We all have them, regardless of who we are. But again, being able to sit with a person, basically park those prejudices and actually really hear what's going on for someone in relation to it. So I suppose I think, that's my little piece there. I think that's wonderful. And it's something that um, I don't remember when I heard it, but quite a number of years ago, I had the thing that we have two of those and one of those, and that's on purpose because we should listen twice as much as we speak. And I heard you um, echo what Ashling was saying earlier about, uh, earlier about validating, you know, so that if we can validate what somebody has experienced and echo what we've heard, you know, I think that's, it goes some way towards that person feeling that they are experiencing what they're experiencing and that it's okay that they're feeling uncomfortable or they're sad or it's a difficult thing and it's normal that they would feel like that given the circumstances and I think that's a bit sometimes that when we have that space to be heard and when it's in a space where we know that we can have that conversation and we're not going to be rushed out the door or you know somebody isn't going to barge in on us or we we can feel safe again again going back to the, the feeling of safety that you spoke about Keith when we talk about feeling safe with this person that we can have that conversation I think that can go a long way to starting to think in, in a different way and sometimes even we might have a conversation that we weren't 
aware that we needed to have, you know, or maybe we start understanding, actually, if I'd have thought about this sooner, maybe I would have realized I already know this piece, but I was so stuck in the problem or so stuck in feeling upset or sad about it that I didn't realize that I had this bit of information. Because I certainly find sometimes when I am stuck in a problem, it doesn't matter what it's for, you know, maybe I'd be, I'd be talking to my team, working something out, and suddenly because we're having a conversation, the answer just kind of pops out. You know, it's like, oh, we did, you know, I didn't realize it was, it would, it would be like that. So I think giving a person space to feel heard and to feel safe, it is such a gift. And I think that goes back to what we were saying earlier again about when we're supporting somebody, we don't have to have all the answers. So it isn't about going there to fix somebody. It isn't about going there to do everything for them. It's about supporting them to have the space and then maybe going beside them as they find what they need. And that's the bit about signposting that we'll go to, you know, maybe this is this is somewhere that I'm aware that maybe might be supportive to you or I actually don't know. So maybe let's have a look and see what we can find together, because I think that's one of the things people are very fearful of because they don't have the answers. They're afraid that they're not trained here to have a conversation. They're afraid of saying the wrong thing. They're afraid that they don't know where to signpost to or they're afraid that the services aren't there you know, or that they're aware of certain services that are overwhelmed. So they don't want to get involved in that conversation. And that is very normal and it's very understandable. But what happens in those moments is that then we have no conversations. And I think it's really important that we move that along and say, you know, while I'm afraid of saying the wrong thing or I'm afraid I don't have the answers, it's really important to me to hear what you have to say. It's really important for me to be here for you. So I think that's, you know, some really, really great points. And thank you for sharing that, Martin. So. Ashley, I'm going to turn to you and ask, what would be your advice to someone who would like to feel more included? Um, I think you have to be aware of your own value and your own self-worth. Um, that's very hard when, when you're dealing with mental illness. Um, I think when you're dealing with mental illness, you do kind of self-exclude um, because you feel like nobody will understand. And I think you know, to feel more included, you need to be, communication is key. Um, a lot of people tend to keep their feelings to themselves because they're afraid of being judged or, but people can't help you if they don't know what's going on. And the majority of the time you will find that people are very willing to help and will want to help you in any way that they possibly can. Um, so it's communicating, um, acknowledging your feelings um, and, and don't try to push them down and, and not face them you know acknowledge your feelings um talk to someone um anyone that will will listen um also you as as an individual i think everyone has you know their own they need to be able to not be dismissive of others feelings either you know um sometimes people are afraid to communicate their feelings because they feel that a person will be dismissive of their feelings and i, I think that's a thing in ireland when somebody tells you oh you know, this thing happened to me, we kind of go, oh yeah, that happened to me too. Well, wait until I tell you, I had this worse than that. Yeah. You so know how you feel. And it's kind of invalidating the person's feelings and they're trying to communicate to you and you're kind of turning it into something about yourself. And I think that's something that we all do. And it's something that you have to be aware of. And 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 your your language, as Martin said, your language is so, so important. And, and the words that you choose to use, um, we just have to be really conscious of that and always be aware of our behaviors and our language um, around others. It, it, it's just, it, it's, it's a simple idea, you know, it's a simple thing, um, but we kind of generally seem to have a problem with doing it. I think they are such wonderful points. And I think it's that, that piece of, of um, minding the gap, you know, that when we're, we're listening for the gap to jump in and, and, and share our own stories. And I think sometimes we feel that if I share my story, then you'll know I'm on your side because you'll know I know what you're talking about. But quite often, if it's that person's first time sharing, if they're feeling that they're going to be judged, if they're feeling that they're going to be discriminated against or treated differently, and then somebody starts talking over them in this idea that they're going to help, that person is going to suck those words back down. And most likely, they're probably not going to share it with you again. So I think that is really important to have that space. And it goes back to what Martin was saying again about listening, that we need to learn how to actively listen. And I think that's really, really important. So thank you for sharing that. I think there are so many different things that we can do to be supportive. And it is about listening to our own thoughts and saying, well, what's that about? Because here's the thing, everybody wants to be 
treated non-judgmentally. The problem is that we are all judgmental as human beings. And part of that goes back to because, you know, thousands of years ago, we had to be judgmental of everything for our safety and for our lives so that we would stay alive. The thing is that we still have those things automatically now, even though we don't have those same dangers. So it's normal that we would have that judgment in an instant. It's what we do with it and it's how we challenge it and it's how we move it along. And then it's about the behaviors and the language that we use and how we individually work with that. And I think that's a really important thing. And it's certainly something that I never looked at until I started working with Seed Change 11 years ago, my own prejudice against other people who have mental health difficulties. You know, when I was diagnosed with depression at 14, I looked at all of the other weirdos and I was like, well, I'm glad I'm not one of them. And then as I got older, I realized that nobody was a weirdo. And I realized that we're all the same. And then when I got re-diagnosed re with bipolar disorder one and I had had multiple suicide attempts, I started realizing actually, there are lots of these different things that if I understood them differently, maybe I wouldn't have treated other people that way. And maybe I wouldn't have treated myself in this way. And I think that's the thing that we never make the time to think about, what do I think about that? Because it's an uncomfortable conversation. It's an uncomfortable thought. And it's really uncomfortable to realize I treated somebody in a bad way or negatively, or I made this assumption because of a prejudice that I have. And that's the thing. I pre-decided something about somebody else because of something that I picked up wherever. And that's what stigma is. And it's about how we individually take that. Because yes, as a society, there's so much that we need to do to change stigma and to reduce it and to eliminate it. But individually, there is so much that we can do to say, well, actually, what's that about? Why did I have that thought? What's the reality behind it? And actually, what's, what's going on for this human being in front of me? What's the experience that they're having? And maybe what do I not know? What can they tell me? And so thinking about asking those questions and having a different way of supporting. would love to ask each of you. So um, Keith, I'm going to turn to you first and ask you about supports and services. So if you're aware of any supports and services that you can signpost for people who are either feeling excluded or who are struggling with their mental health at the moment, if there's anything that you'd like to shout out. Um, I'd say just, I'd go with the Samaritans. Just, I've just finished training in relation to being a, a listener with the Samaritans and I found their training very, very good. And the people that were involved there are absolutely excellent. Um, and they give you that space just to talk and they will be there to listen to you. Um, and they will be there for you 24 seven as well. So definitely, definitely the Samaritans. Um, in relation to anything else in relation to your mental health, especially the route that I went down in relation to a, a suicide attempt, um, we'd look at Suicide or Survive as well. They're, um, they're based in Shankill in Dublin. Um, I'm sure they have a website there. They have great programs in relation to support around that for family members and for people that have um, suicidal ideations or have attempted suicide as well. So I, I mentioned the two of them, really, 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 really good organisations. Absolutely wonderful. Thank you. And just to say to anybody on this call or watching afterwards, the Samaritans, you don't have to be suicidal to ring them. And I would really hope that you would ring them long before that. And the other thing is that it, it is a service that if you are the carer or supporter, it's also open to you. So if it's a matter that it's a financial problem, if you your head is melted with work, you know, it doesn't matter what it is. They are there to have a conversation with you. They are there to listen. 24 seven so don't wait and that is one of the biggest things and a bit a very different experience I had with the Samaritans in going to them earlier um, from a point of view of suicide, suicide to survive I know that they have national programs and also Keith you mentioned about family support so just to, to um, raise a mention for Shine um, while we have individual support we also do family groups as well so shine.ie is a support there um, so Martin I'm going to turn to you with the same question if you were thinking about supports and signposts um, and services that you'd be able to let people know about who would you like to, to, to shout out to okay uh, the, the shout out absolutely as keith is saying the samaritans 116 123 also in addition to that i'd say people who are struggling maybe with depression or anxiety or living with depression and anxiety aware are, uh, can be an absolutely fantastic support out there and again they run a number of different psychoeducational programs such as living life to the full which i think everyone should do doesn't matter if you're, you know, so it's a fantastic life skills program for anyone to complete. So there are examples of it, aware.ie. And in addition to that, there, what do you got? I suppose where somebody will say, for example, um, 
is struggling, maybe as a result of the loss of a sibling or a child, Anamkara is a fantastic organization out there that provides support in relation to, you know, the, de the death of a family member, you know, a sibling or, what do you got, or, or, a, or a child from that perspective. They would be in, in conjunction with the other organizations that you've already mentioned at the moment there as well. Absolutely wonderful. Thank you. And and on that one, there is also another one um, called HUG, that's H-U-D-D. Um, and again, they are um, particularly parental support around the, um, the loss of a child by suicide. So there are a lot of amazing supports there and it is about connecting in with those. So actually, I'm going to turn to you for exactly the same question. If you were to think about supports or services that you could signpost to for either somebody who's feeling excluded or somebody struggling with their mental health, if there's anything that hasn't been mentioned so far who would you like to shout out to? Um, I'd like to shout out Faroiga um, and they're an organization that Mia actually attended herself um, and they offer a big sister big brother mentorship program um, especially for youths who um, are feeling um, like they don't belong or they're feeling a sense of loss or they're just trying to find themselves in the world and it, it's a really good program and, and Mia was involved with it up until um, her death and it really it helped her really with her self-confidence um, and uh, her big sister mentor was amazing with her and used to take her out once a week um, for you know like uh, anything that she might want to do um, you know anything that she had a, she had a hobby with makeup and, and, and nails and things like that so you know they you, they, they try to get her places to do courses and things like that like they help you kind of see forward you know Mia was kind of in a fog and didn't know what to do with her life and they kind of steered her in the right direction um while she was enrolled with them um another organization is pieta house i i can't i'm so grateful to pieta house um they they helped with mia um up until her death they were the only real support that we had uh following her suicide attempt in june um they have also they have a bereavement counseling service that i have been availing of for the last two years and i don't think i would be as strong as i am today um if it wasn't for the help that they have given me over the last two years so i'd like to give a big shout out to pay the house they're a, um, a really good service and they do a lot of great work thank you so much and i think it's wonderful to hear about the good things that are happening and i'm delighted that that support has been there for you and i think it's wonderful you know you mentioned about you know getting involved with makeup and doing different things it's so important that we remember even when we are struggling with our mental health that it's an experience that we're going through it isn't the sum of us we are more than that we are more than this experience you know we are a, a colleague we're a friend we're a daughter we're an aunt we're a, an artist maybe you know there's lots of different things that we could be and we're not any one of them on its own and I think that's really really hard to remember when we get stuck into those places so um, just as a reminder any of those places that we have just spoken about are currently in the chat if you would like to take a list it will also be listed with the uh, recording of this event so as we're coming to time I would like to thank our speaker so very much for taking part in really what has been a challenging conversation because it's been so loaded and emotional but so important I think to start understanding things that have been difficult how much better they can be if we were to be more inclusive. As part of our Green Ribbon campaign, we have had so many different conversations nationally. And one of the things that we have also done is passed a lot of Green Ribbons. So I would like to fi finalise and close our Green Ribbon campaign for 2021 and this event with a video called Pass the Ribbon and to thank everybody who has been involved. So there we are.
So that concludes our Green Ribbon campaign and our final event. I thank you so much for your involvement. Thank you for all of your conversations this month. And I hope that you will continue to wear your Green Ribbon. I hope you'll continue to have mental health conversations and find out about what we can do because just because the Green Ribbon campaign has finished doesn't mean that our work has. So if you wanna find out more about what we can do for the rest of the year and in between our next event, you can find out more at seatchange.ie. To contact us, it's info at seatchange.ie. We do still have some ribbons, so if you would like some ahead of World Mental Health Day, please do contact us. So again, that's info at seatchange.ie. This video and all the other events, including our podcast, are all available on our website and across our social media. So you'll find us on Twitter, on Instagram, and on Facebook, Sea Change IRL or Sea Change Ireland. Thank you so much for a fantastic campaign and for sticking with us. I hope you have an amazing afternoon.